Well, I was always nuts about music, you know, um, from being a kid. Um, and when the when the news signature tune came on the telly, I would be in my high chair, whatever it is that baby sit in, and I would one particular theme tune. I don't know what it was. No, um, excited me so much. I used to throw myself out of the out of the high chair. <laughs> so I had this I had this sort of obsession with music, which thankfully has never left me. Um, but I remember on a Saturday in England, um, if it was raining, you did one of two things. You either um, watched the sport or you took refuge in, in BBC Two. And I had absolutely no interest in the sport. Um, and on BBC Two, invariably on a Saturday afternoon, they used to show these musical films. Um, I remember looking at Singing in the Rain when I was, I don't know, nine or ten, and liking the purple sort of backdrop drop of the main titles and just absolutely loving the noise of it. I didn't know what it was about. I, was, I, you know, I didn't know any of the people in it were. Um, didn't get half the jokes. I just loved the noise of it. And it was... Years later, when I started conducting, I, I thought, why doesn't my orchestra sound like this? Why doesn't my orchestra for No No Nanette in Gateshead uh, <laughs> sound, like, sound like this? Yeah. And I was on a quest from that day onwards to make the group of players in front of me um, sound like that. So. Well, um, after you developed your passion in the noble city of Gateshead, you then um, you came down to London to the Royal College of Music. And I, I'd like to ask you whether once you <laughs> declared your interest in the Hollywood musical <laughs> at the Royal College, you were thought of as a nutter or uh, you were uh, appreciated? Pretty, pretty much, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I remember a, f a few weeks before I was in coming to London, for the first time, I was conducting Brigadoon in, in the theatre in Newcastle with the amateurs, and everybody knew I was going off to London. This lady said, I hope you're not going to conduct this rubbish when you go to London. I hope you're going <laughs> to concentrate on serious studies. And I thought, well, will they really think it's rubbish? Because I never made a difference. I never been my attitude between Brahms and sort of... Sort of Eric Coates, you know, th th it was, if it was good of its kind, then I, then I would take it on board. Um, so I was slightly terrified um, that I would sort of be a laughing stock because this lady, one of the leading lights of the Operatic Society, had told me that I would be. And so I came to London, 1990, I guess, and um, I kept my head down for the first sort of three or four months of term. And then there was a, a student rag week, and they needed somebody to play the piano for the, for the, you know, the sort of cabaret thing that they did. And, um, and so I was somehow, I sort of proposed myself for this, and then took it on board to write arrangements for a 20-piece orchestra, and had a, a, you know, did a reasonably neat job of it, I suppose, because it sounded quite nice. And then... Um, all of a sudden, people were interested in playing something other than Beethoven, Bach, Brahms. You know, it was that nobody had been doing that, and all the students were keen to do more of it. And so it became a sort of I set up a little hobby orchestra, um, and of course the one thing that was true then, which is still true now, is that players always love to play well-written light music of any genre. It's it's gratifying. It's gratefully written. Um, it makes your orchestra sound a million dollars. Um, so there, I never encountered any snobbery ever from musicians. And the only snobbery I've ever really come across has been from the ill-informed. <laughs> well, right. <laughs> so, I mean, if... if we're, we're among friends here, so we, we don't have to do it here. But, <laughs> but if we're among uh, um, enemies, shall we say, um, how does one justify an interest in the music of the Hollywood musical? Okay, well, I mean, sort of reducing it down to the, to the bare bones, the sort of stuff I'm interested in, which is largely in the first half of the last century, um, you're dealing with 
George Gershman, Irving Berlin, Jerome Kern, Harry Warren, Cole Porter, that crowd, writing at the peak of their powers. Um, and you could argue that the popular song has, has never enjoyed such a heyday. I mean, the greatest songs of Gershman, I've said before, and I'll say again, will, will, are in my opinion, my humble opinion, as great as any of the, the songs of Schubert. And the level of invention in both the melodies and the lyrics is on an astonishingly high level for decades. Um, and you had this system whereby you, you had a composer writing the tunes, um, a lyricist working in collaboration with the composer. These songs were then passed on to an arranger, or in the case of one of the movie studios that we talk about later, a series of arrangers, um, and then played by expert musicians and sung by a, a person who did nothing but sing songs. Um, 60 years later, you'd find pretty much one person trying to do all of that themselves. And, and you're never going to equal that level of expertise when you've got six people who've devoted their whole lives to doing one particular element. So you had this, as I said before, sort of conveyor belt of, of okay. expertise. Okay, so, so there you were in the Royal College of Music, and um, what happened next? What, 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 what did you move on to after that? Well, I suppose I, I formed my orchestra um, just as I was leaving college in 1994, and that happened because I had a, a gig, I had a job at Grosvenor House Hotel, where in the afternoon we would play for tea, be piano and violin in the <coughs> afternoon, and in the evening it would be a jazz trio, piano, bass and drums, and I, I did both. Um, I hardly got any studying done, I was always doing these moment <laughs> gigs. Um, and for the afternoon slot, I would be working with string players from the Royal College, violinists, but sometimes cellists, and then there would be jazz players in the evening. And I, it was this sort of fusion of these two sets of colleagues, if you like. I remember I did a concert at the college of fairly standard sort of theatre music, and I, I used the drummer from the jazz trio in that, Matt Skelton. And he said to me, we're doing these things at the Peach from the Park with a trio, a quintet, a jazz quintet with a singer. And it would be lovely if you could add some string arrangements for these songs. And so we did that. And people came to hear it. And we didn't think anybody was going to come. We were just larking about, you know. It, none of it was for anything other than ourselves. And then someone on the back of that asked us to do a concert. There's a guy who wanted to be, fancied himself as a singer, and just turned up one day at my door with a, with a pot of money and said, will you put together a great big orchestra for me to sing to? <laughs> and that was the start of it. And we had a big band, which Matt Skelton, the drummer, fixed, and I got all these string players. And that was where it all started. I'm sure it didn't sound very good, but we spent, you know, week after week, I mean, d playing together really regularly because we got some residencies after that. We got a, a job at the um, Royal Garden Hotel. We were there for nine years playing for dinner and dancing, and then we had another gig at a restaurant in Essex with a full 17-piece band. And so all during this time, and it was, I'd say, 14 years of doing that, or so, um, you're refining what you do, finding out who the best players are, forging a style, getting repertoire together. Yeah. I'm sure that um, many people in the audience will, will have seen your, your concert either live at the Royal Albert Hall or else on, on TV, and what a splendid, splendid concert um, that was. Can you tell us something about how you, you got involved with the, with the Albert Hall? Uh, well, the manager of my orchestra, Tom Croxon, um, decided that we'd been playing in restaurants and gigs here and there for too long, and it might be an idea to do a gig without the sound of cutlery. <laughs> and so, so he, sa he, just, he tried to get us a prom for five years because we'd done an MGM concert at the Festival Hall 2003 um, and he said this would make a great prom and the proms absolutely said no not on your life <laughs> <laughs> it's too low bro <laughs> and 
and he asked him again. You have to admire his tenacity. And and eventually, they relented. Or oh, there might be a change of manager. I don't know. Anyway, we got given a gig, and we just put together a program of those MGM things that everybody knows and loves, and had some good singers, and rehearsed for a couple of days, did the show, and um, everything went barmy, nuts. <laughs> uh, at the last count, almost just under or just over 100,000 letters and emails. What um, is going on here at the moment, of course, is the, the MGM musical season, and, and I might ask you what it is that you feel is special about MGM and the MGM musical. I think they probably made the best musicals at <coughs> MGM. Um, they just got into the rhythm of, of making them, and they had, they had all the best stars for making musicals. You know, they had Fred Astaire, they had Gene Kelly, they had Frank Sinatra, they had Judy Garland, and they had Johnny Green running the music department. So they were really set up. And they also did a lot of original film musicals instead of adapting musicals from the from the stage. And, you know, each of the studios, I I, I would say, had their strengths in, in certain genres, but at MGM, they, they, they made the best musicals and made a fortune from, from doing them. It was what made the studio rich. Um, the quintessential sound of the MGM musicals, the main architect being Conrad Salinger, is um, a very high-class theatre orchestra sound, but with a, with a definite bias towards the sort of dance band, sort of swing. 